and they will only be oppressed and spoiled evermore. And no man shall be able to save them. Can you see the danger of not having vision? Can you see the difficulty in people's ways when there is no vision? People will be perishing. The sinners will be dying. Backsliders will be coming more and more hardened because the people that are trying to lead them in the church, the people that are trying to speak to them, they are not doing the work as if they were having vision. And they are not leaders in our church. We're looking at other churches. We're looking at other denominations. But how about our church? Do we not have people in the church who wake and sleep every day and they do not know where they are going? They do not know where, why they are living? Are there not people that are preaching in the house fellowship and they do not know why we're there in the house fellowship? Are there not people that will stand before 10 people, 12 people, 15 people? They don't know why they are standing there. Are there not people that have not seen any vision of, from God? They don't have any burden in their heart. They do not know any direction the people of God should be moving. And yet they have outline in their hand, paper in their hand, booklet in their hand. And they stand before people. Are there not people that do not have any feeling in their heart? Any burden in their heart? Any agony in their heart? Any suffering in their heart? Any burden that will make them to know that these people are supposed to be going somewhere. And I'm supposed to lead them to that place they are going. No vision. No voice, no future. Are there not house fellowships that have scattered? Are there not people in house fellowships that have just run away? Their leaders don't have any vision, and those people have scattered in the wilderness of this world. Everybody is confused. Everybody, they are scattered, and they are all destroyed because the person that is leading them is a blind man, is a blind woman, groping in the noonday, in the noonday of spiritual illumination. In the noonday of spiritual knowledge, in the noonday of spiritual, um, of spiritual anointing, see the church, see what God has given us, the insight, the knowledge, the revelation, the anointing, the authority. And yet at such a noonday, such people are groping in the dark. They have no vision. They have no voice. They have no future. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, 1 Samuel chapter 3, Reading from verse 1. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Can you imagine a church that started out with real power, with real, the greatness of God was known in their midst, and now a time came when there was nobody in the whole land that had any vision any insight, any knowledge, any revelation, any direct communication with the Lord Almighty. Do you remember how the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt? Moses had a vision. Without that vision, Israel would have remained in Egypt forever. Before you can bring a group of people or a tribe or a family before you can bring any section of society out of Egypt and get them to the land of Canaan, the person responsible for bringing them will have to have a vision. You have not seen the vision of the burning bush that is not consumed. You have not heard the voice of the Almighty God. He has not told you to leave all the mundane things you are doing and march ahead and do something that is eternally significant. You have no vision, you have no voice. You have no voice, you have no future. You have not seen the burning bush. You have not seen that in the midst of the affliction of the people of God, these are the people of God that will manifest power in Egypt. The afflicted people will become the overcoming people. You have not seen that vision. You don't have a vision. You don't have a voice. You don't have any future. You have not seen the vision of the burning bush. And the Lord has not called you by name, saying, Drop everything you are doing. I've raised you up. I've seen the affliction of my people Israel. Go into Egypt and bring them out. You have not heard the voice of God. You have not seen any vision. You have not seen what God wants to do in this hour, in your community, in, in this city, in this state, in this nation. If you have no vision, you have no voice. If you have no voice, you have no future. But you see, these were people. It was on the basis of the vision of Moses. They came out. And as they came out, God started revealing himself more and more to them. They saw the vision. The vision of the Almighty. They saw how the thunder came on Mount Sinai. They heard the trumpet sound. 
They saw a lot of things. And they knew that this God, he is the God in heaven. But now, there was no open vision in the land. Eli was there. They had leaders there. But then the leaders had no vision. And if it is not that God raised up a person like Samuel, that, um, that nation will have no future. Are you like Eli or like Samuel? Look at it in verse 2. And it came to pass at that time that Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. Not only that there was no spiritual vision, there was no physical vision. The man's eye was going dim. Can you imagine? If somebody is blind physically and blind spiritually, what hope do we have in the nation then? What hope do we have in the church then? People that are ignorant of secular knowledge and ignorant of spiritual knowledge. Ignorant in every area. And if you are ignorant like that, how will you be able to lead the people of God out of the wilderness? It says in verse 3, Here the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where, where the ark of God was, and Samuel laid down to sleep. Can you imagine people sleeping near the ark of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, and yet no vision? Can you imagine people getting near or sleeping near the lamp of God in the temple, and yet no vision? And the Lord said, Call Samuel. And he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. The point here is this. If you are under Eli that has no vision, any voice of God you hear, he will, go, he will tell you, go and lie down. There is nothing to it. Isn't that what we see today? Many Eli's in many denominations. There are young people that are getting converted, maybe through some of the fellowship groups in their school, or lunch hour, or maybe through crusades, or maybe through retreats, that these people come from other denominations, and then when they get over here, they are converted. And God begins to show them vision as to what they should do. God begins to call their name as to what they should do. Well, because they are not part of us here, they go to their leaders in their denominations and churches. It so happens that these leaders are blind physically and blind spiritually. They do not have any knowledge of the Bible, neither do they have any revelation of the spiritual things. And when these young people will go to them and say, the Lord is calling me. The Lord is giving me assignment. The Lord wants me to bring a revival in this church. The Lord wants us in this church to be talking about being born again and being saved and giving our lives to the Lord. The Lord wants us to evangelize in this church. The Eli in the denomination will say, go and lie down. Go and sleep. Go and rest. There is nothing that is happening. They will not be able to recognize the voice of God. Well, if that is happening out there, we understand. Because for a long time, the Lord has departed from a lot of those places. How about here? It's happening here too. The people are hearing the voice of God. Their leaders do not recognize the voice of God. They are having burden. Their leaders don't understand what burden is all about. They are having vision of the Lord. Their leaders don't know what vision is all about. And some of the people that are rising up like Samuel and saying, I believe God wants me to do this. I believe God wants me to evangelize. I believe God wants me to go into the villages. I believe God wants me to reach out at the lunch hour time. I believe God wants me to reach out in the hospital. I believe God wants me to reach out in the prisons. They say, go and lie down. There's nothing to it. This one that we're doing here is enough. We come on Monday, we come on Thursday, we come for Saturday workers meeting. We do some little, little things in the, in the zone to stir up things and yet nobody gets converted. To keep religion going on, that's enough. Go and lie down. The leader is blind. He'll blindfold the people. Remember again, if you are blind, you will never lead people beyond that dark region of the temple in Shiloh. You will not be able to do it. Because you will not have the vision that will spur them up and show them that they ought to move ahead and do something definite and something great for the glory of God. In 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6 from verse 13. 
And he said, Go and spy where he is, and that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots, and a great host. And they came by night, and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, and was gone forth, behold, and house and host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? You see, when you have no vision, everything you see in your community and your zone and your district will make you fearful. You will be afraid. Because you need to understand, principalities and powers are not all dead. They are still alive. The rulers of the darkness of, the, of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places, they have not all died. They are still alive. Familiar spirits, they have not all died. They are still in the world today. And some of them may be sent from Satan from Syria, into your zone, into your district. You wake up in the morning, they say that this is troubling that uh, house fellowship. This is troubling them in that area. This is uh, causing um, maybe stagnancy in that area. And then you wake up, since you don't have any vision of any other thing, all you can see is difficulty. All you can see is problem. All you can see will be the Assyrians that have been sent from the king of Syria. All you can see will be the soldiers that will be sent to take the people and not to allow them to make any progress in the things of the Lord. What do you say? You just cry out, at last, my master, what shall we do? You'll be confused. You'll say nobody can work for God in this zone, in this district at the time like this. Transportation is difficult. The Muslims are difficult. Religious people are difficult. Educated people are difficult. Illiterates are difficult. We cannot get to the rich. They have too much money. We cannot get to the poor. They don't have any money at all. We cannot get to car owners because uh, they, are, they are proud. We cannot get to people that don't have any vehicle. They say there is no transportation to come to church. We cannot reach anybody. The children are rebellious. The adults are also not uh, receiving the gospel. We cannot reach anybody anymore all you will see will be difficulty you have no vision you have no voice you have no future there's no future for the zone that has no vision because no vision will mean there will be no voice no voice will mean there will be no future and thank god elisha had the vision of the lord you see it is not great academic knowledge we have a lot of people in this land that have great academic knowledge but there is no vision there is no voice. There is no future. Elisha did not have too much money. It's not money. We have some churches that command a lot of money. Millions of naira. Maybe millions of dollars and pounds. But then, no vision, no voice, no future. We have a lot of people that have lawyers and engineers and doctors and highly placed people. And they have government officials attending their church. But that's not the point. They have no vision. They have no voice. They have no future. You see, the secret of the success of the work of God in your life and in my life is you must have a vision. Because where there is no vision, the people perish. Thank God Elisha had vision. He knew what the young man did not know. It will be wonderful if coordinators knew what zonal leaders did not know. And then they can direct those zonal leaders. Every difficulty you bring to a man that knows and has a vision of God, the man that has vision has solution. But you see, when you bring problem to a coordinator and you say, this is a problem we have, this problem we have in this zone, this is what we have, we don't know what we're going to do about this transportation, we don't know what we're going to do about these young people, familiar spirit, we don't know what we're going to do about these people that are backsliding, we don't know what we're going to do about these people that are just immoral, we don't know what we're going to do about reaching out to these offices, we don't know what we're going to do about reaching out to these secondary schools, we don't know what we're going to do about our women fellowship, we don't know what we're going to today about hospitals in our community we don't know what we're going to do about villages in the suburb we don't know what we're going to do about insane people we don't know what we're going to do about the beggars that roam our streets in our district well if he doesn't have a vision he has no solution he says he throws up his hand and says, well i don't know you let us just be praying i don't know what we're going to do i don't know where we're going to go i don't know how we're going to solve this problem I don't know how we're going to be able to make the church grow in a difficult time like this. Transportation, what can I do? About reaching out to prison, what can I do? About reaching out to hospital, what can I do? About reaching out to the invalids, what can I do? 
about our members that are getting sick and their sickness is chronic. What can I do? A man that has no vision has no voice. And a man that has no voice has no future. But you know, Elisha had a vision. Elisha had a voice. And Elisha had a future for the nation. And so he said in verse 16, And he answered, Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. You see that? He had a vision. He had a vision. And he had a voice. You see, when a man has a vision, he can talk. He can talk. He can talk. The people that have no vision, they have nothing to say. If they try to say anything, their voice will not give you courage. Their voice will not give you boldness. Their voice will not give you direction. Their voice will not give you insight. Their voice will not give you revelation. They will be talking words of darkness and words of blind people. He said, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. He himself had a vision. But there's another thing here. It's not enough to have a vision. You must be able to open people's eyes. Physically, spiritually, you should be able to open people's eyes. What does that mean? You should be able to get other people to have vision. You see, what matters is having vision. Because if you don't have vision, you cannot even start the work at all. If you don't have vision, you cannot even continue the work at all. If you don't have vision, you cannot maintain your stand at all. If you don't have vision, you cannot overcome the enemy at all. If you don't have any vision, you'll be blank, you'll be bleak, you'll be dark. If you don't have any vision, you'll be totally blind. If you don't have any vision, you will never be able to take any step. It's important that you yourself will have a vision. Not only that, you'll be able to pass that vision across and make other people around you have vision. You see, before we started this deeper life, I had vision. And I thank God I know how to maintain that vision. I know how to keep up that burden. I know how to keep up that anointing. And thank God that the state overseers, that God has used me to be able to raise up, I pass vision across to them. In some states now, they have about 16,000, 17,000 members. They had vision. If I didn't pass the vision across to them, if I was the only person that had vision, how would we be able to do that? Because they will not have any vision. And if they don't have any vision in their state, they'll be blind. They'll be blank. And everything will be totally dark. They will not be able to lead the people. When we started this house fellowship system, there was no house fellowship system before. It was vision. Without vision, house fellowship will never have been started. It is vision that brings about this one. You call it miracle revival hour. It is vision that brought it about. You call it great miracle crusade at the national stadium. It is vision that brings it about. You call it workers retreat and general retreat. It is vision that brings it about. You call it outreach into uh, missionary uh, places. It is vision that brings it about. And you know, when you have a vision, you should be able to make other people see. If you only have the vision and other people cannot see, what, sh what will you do? But you know, when we started our fellowship, thank God there was vision. And some of those uh, zones, you know now, some of the places we call districts now, they were zones originally. But those original zonal leaders, they had vision. I had the vision, I passed it across. And as the vision came to them, we had zones that, in, that um, expanded until they became 3,000, a single zone. We had zones that started, and when they started, they were not up to 100. Eventually, they became more than 3,000. Some zones that started, and they were not more than 200. When they expanded, because I had vision, I passed the vision to them, and they also had the vision. They were going with the vision. They became 5,000. You see what we call a Gege district now? It was just a zone. What we call a Limonshaw district now, it, it was just a zone. What we call Festus district now, it was just a zone. What we call Ajegunle and Orile Igomo, all together now, all that together was just a zone. What we call Bagada district and Shomolu district now, all of them together was just a zone. Think about it. And yet, you have these zones because the original people, the original people, they had vision. We pass the vision across to them. And if you are taking over today, we have now, after we raised up the vision to a particular level, we now have it, we now have it in your hand. And you have no vision, you are blind, you are blank, no direction, no vision, 
no voice, there will be no future for that zone. And yet, if we're going to have the original vision that we have, your, your zone now, which is more than 200, should eventually become more than 3,000. And your zone now, which is maybe even just about li a little more than 100, eventually it will be more than um, 3,000. You see, among the secondary school uh, children, 1979, God gave me a vision to all these people that there will be free vacation school. We started collecting them together. And from that, we started a success camp. And through the success camp, we have been, you know, teaching those children all over Nigeria. We'll get them together in this state, in that locality, in this locality, the same in Lagos. Uh, we always add it. And then I handed over the vision to other people. I don't know what they have done with the vision now. Are they still having the success camp? Are they still getting all these thousands, thousands of children together? Where there is no vision, there will be no voice. Where there is no voice, there will be no future. But then look at Elisha. Then Eli and Elisha prayed in verse 17 and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. The reason we're here at this retreat is that God will open your eyes. Because the very beginning of progress is that you need your eyes to be opened. The beginning of success in the work of God is that your eyes should be open. There are people that are just sitting on the work of God. The work is there. They do not see the possibilities. They do not see the expansion. They do not see the great things that can be done. Their eyes have not been opened. The possibilities are there. The great things are there. The things that could be done in that ministry, maybe in the district, Maybe among the women, maybe among the children, maybe among the secondary school students, maybe in the hospitals, maybe in the prison, maybe in the villages. The great things that can be done, they are there. But because there is no vision, nothing is being done. No vision, no voice, no future. But you see, when your eyes are open, there will be no fear again. When your eyes are open, you'll know that there are resources available. When your eyes are open, you will know that all things are possible in the Lord and with the Lord. And here he said, O oh Lord, open, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. You know, if somebody is a member of the prayer warriors... And he never sees the vision of angels of God around the people of God. He never sees the power of God in the church of the living God. He never see, sees the authority of the blood of Jesus Christ. All that he sees is, uh, you know, some little, little familiar spirits. Some secondary school girls that are trying to make trouble with their witchcraft. Only all that he sees is, uh, you know, some people that have belonged to some of these uh, candle-burning, incense-burning religions. And they came from all these uh, various places. And they want to torment people in the zone or in the area. All you can see is these people having the wrong kind of spirit. His eyes are never open to the angels of God that encamp around the children of God. His eyes are never open to the everlasting arm beneath every believer. His eyes are never open to the fact that the blood of Jesus will totally destroy the works of the enemy. His eyes are not open to the authority of the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Ghost. He will never be able to do anything. That's why I said the beginning of success in whatever we're doing for the Lord is that we'll have a vision. I pray that God will open your eyes at this retreat. When God opens your eyes, there will be no fear again. When God opens your eyes, you will see the power of God, the purpose of God, the plan of God, the victory of Christ, the message of the Spirit, the possession of the church, the inheritance of the believer. And you will see the fulfillment of the promise of God to march on for the believer. So then, what do we do? We need to have vision. How do we have vision? Because if you don't know how to have vision, you may just close your eyes and say, I'm waiting for vision, I'm waiting for vision, I'm waiting for vision. How do you have a vision? Number one, you sit with the people in need and you see their need. Sit with them and see their need. In Ezekiel chapter 3, Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 15, Then I came to them of the captivity of Tel Aviv, that dwelt in the, by the river and I sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days. 
And it came to pass at the end of the seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me. Ezekiel had vision. The word of the Lord came unto him. Insight, revelation, commission came unto him. How did he have that vision? He sat where the people sat. I sat where they sat. If you never visit hospital and see how people are suffering, you'll never have vision for those in hospitals. If you never see it among those highly placed people and listen to them, listen to their heart cry, listen to their anguish, listen to all their suffering, you will never see, you'll never have any vision for them. If you never uh, sit down among the divorcee, the people that have been divorced in this land, multitudes of them, millions of them, broken homes. If you never talk to their children, if you never talk to those women in the market, if you never talk to those women in your place of work, you do not sit where the people sit to listen to them, to see their cry, to see their anguish, to see the burden in their heart, to see their confusion, and to see all their sorrow, all their crying, and all they are talking about. You will never have any vision for them. If you never go to the prison and see those prison uh, places, see how dirty, see how deprived they are, and see how they labor, and see what kind of food they are giving them, and see all the sufferings they are going through, you'll never have any vision for them. If you never go to behind the bar, and see and peep into all the people in the cell that have not even been tried in the court. Some of them have been there for one year, some of them for six months, some of them for three months, and they are punished. It's even sometimes worse than the real prison itself. If you never see their cry, if you never notice about their problem, you will never see, you will never have a vision if you never go to the villages and sit where the people sit and see how their idols are punishing them, harassing them, and tormenting them. If you never see all the kinds of sicknesses that come upon their children, incurable diseases, nameless diseases, long-standing diseases, coming to them in the villages, you will never have any vision for them. If you never see it in the slum areas, in the slum areas where there are a lot of mosquitoes, a lot of marshy ground, and yet people have built some shacks in all those places, and they say they are living there because there's no other place they will live. You will never have any vision for them if you never go in the midst of the people at Ajegunle and see in that thickly populated area how they are suffering, how they are wailing, how things are very difficult for them. You will never have a vision for those people if you never go around the people in those Morocco areas and see the evil spirits that are tormenting them and see all the things that are oppressing them, and see and hear all the things they are saying among themselves that they are dying. They don't know who will help them. If you don't sit where they sit, if you don't talk to them, if you don't understand what they are going through, you will never have any vision. But Ezekiel said, I sat where they sat. And when I sat where they sat, seven days, just meditating, just looking, just thinking, just seeing their sorrow, just seeing their anguish. I, he was not detached from the people. If you are detached from the people, you will never have a vision. You will you'll just be bypassing people. You will not know how they are sorrowful, how they are suffering, how they suffer. But he said, after I sat with them seven days, the word of the Lord came unto me. Not only that you sit where the people sit, so that you can see their need. Number two, you ask about their deplorable conditions. Ask about their deplorable condition. Nehemiah chapter 1 from verse 1. The words of Nehemiah the son of Hak Ali. And it came to pass in the month of Sisleu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Ananer, one of my brethren, came and he and certain of the men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were led of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Now there are people, they never ask about anybody. They never ask about their co-tenants. They never even talk to the people that are living in their community. There are people that go to the villages, they never check up what happens to the villagers. They just bypass a lot of people. They do not discuss with people. But if you are going to have a vision, you must hold conversation with these people. Ask people when they come to Lagos here from the villages, when they come from the suburb, 
when you come from various parts of the districts, ask them, how about this? How about that? What's happening to the people? How are they suffering? Ask the nurses questions. You never talk to nurses about uh, what is happening in the nation. Ask the policemen among us and policewomen among us the problem of people on their crimes, the crimes they are committing. When you ask people, you will be able to have God will begin to talk to you from there. Nehemiah was in Shushan in, at the palace. He wouldn't have known what was going on. He would never have had anybody. He would never have had any load upon his heart, any concern, any conviction. He would never have had any vision, but he asked them. He asked the people that came of his brethren. Certain that came from Judah, I said, I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped. Verse 3, they said unto me, the remnant that had left of the captivity in the pro there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burnt with fire. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept. The vision started. The vision began. All these things that we're reading about in the book of Nehemiah will never be there without Nehemiah, first of all, asking questions. You will never add anything to history without your asking questions. You will not be able to know people are suffering without asking questions. When he asked questions and they answered him, he didn't joke about the answer. He prayed about the answer. He wept about the answer. He became concerned about the answer. And then he said in verse 5, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy, with them that love and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eye open, thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, that which I pray before thee now, day and night, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. He began to pray. Not only that he prayed, he wept. He didn't only do that for one day. He prayed night and day until the vision came. After the vision, the opportunity came. After the opportunity, then also the provision came for him to be able to do all that he needed to do. If you're all the time by yourself, think, thinking about your own problem, thinking about your own difficulties, thinking about your own need, you never see it with the other people to see their need. You'll never have a vision. And if you have no vision, you have no voice, you have no future. If you never ask about the deplorable conditions of other people that need help, you'll never have any vision, no vision, no voice, no future. Not only that, as you hear these uh, things, and God begins to give you this vision, you must share the vision with other people of great body. You share with other people of great body. You do not uh, just uh, have a vision and then you do nothing about it. You discuss it. You tell other people, you know this is the vision I'm, I'm having. This is the body I'm having. This is the concern I'm having. These people perishing in the hospitals, can't we do something about it? All these people in the prisons, can't we do something about it? All these criminals, can't we do something about it? All these teenagers in the motor parks, can't we do something about it? We only have an evening um, house fellowship on Sunday. But during the day, all these people that are just roaming about, can't we do something about it? All these jobless people, can't we do something about them? Can we not uh, show people how they can be self-employed just like we did for free vacation school? And we're trying to teach those students how to study chemistry and mathematics and biology and English. And in the midst of that, we're giving them the gospel. There are a lot of people. In this city alone, we have millions of people that are jobless. Can you not collect them together if you are free during the morning hours? And when you collect them together, can you not show them how they can walk with their hands? And while you're teaching them how they can walk with their hands, then you're giving them the gospel. Can we not do something? Or for these people, for the beggars, uh, don't the beggars have soul or spirit? If these beggars die, as many of them die just on the side of the road, what will happen unto them? Do you ever discuss with a beggar? Even if you don't have any money to give them, 
And why shouldn't you even have money to give them? You eat every day. Shouldn't you be able to give them something and then begin to discuss the gospel with them? The blind, the lame, the refugees, the foreigners that have been taken away, uh, that have run away from their countries because of war. Don't they have souls? Don't they have spirit? If they die, will they not go to hell if they are not born again? Do you ever have any concern for them? Do you ever go to the hospitals? Even if you cannot reach the people that are sick in the hospital, I but there are relatives that are visiting them every evening with sorrow, with concern. They cannot go to their places of work because their relatives are sick. Their children are sick. Their beloved wives are sick. And their husbands, the breadwinner, has become sick. And every evening they go to the hospital. You pass by the hospitals and dispensaries and clinics in your district. You never go in there. If you never go in there, how will you have vision? You sit where they sit. You ask them about their deployable condition. You share with people of great like passion, great body. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 17. Proverbs 27 verse 17 iron sharpness iron so a man sharpened the countenance of his friend iron sharpness iron you know why some workers are discouraged and they say they are giving up the work they never share with other people that are doing the work they never share with other people that have great body they never share with other people that have vision and then number four pray on the suffering and the perishing people you pray for them. There are a lot of people that are suffering and perishing. Prostitutes, they are suffering. Many of them are having AIDS, incurable disease now. Many of them have infections now. Many of them have a venereal disease now. And they are suffering. You pray about these suffering people. There are backsliders who have been in the church before. May not be in deeper life alone maybe deeper life and other churches, but because of some problems in their lives, they backslid. Pray about suffering, perishing people. And uh, there are highway robbers, they too, they are perishing. Day after day, they're shooting some of them down and they are dying. There are people that are taking marijuana. There are people that are taking drugs. There are people that are destroying their lives. Pray about suffering and perishing people. Of course, there are people in hospitals. There are people that feel that there's no hope for them. Pray about suffering and perishing people. There are villagers that have been oppressed by herbalists, depressed by all the things around them. Hunger is there. Then poverty is there. Witchcraft is there. Sorcery is there. On the spiritual side, they are oppressed. On the physical side, they have nothing to eat. You pray about suffering and perishing people. If you pray about them, God will give you a vision. God will tell you what to do. Because a praying man is a concerned man. A man that is praying not just for himself. You see, when all the time you are thinking about yourself, we come to a retreat like this, and all you have is that you write some things on paper. And every time we want to pray, you are lifting up the paper. You are selfish, you will never have any vision. You are only thinking about yourself. I need a job. I need a child. I need a wife. I need a husband, I need job, I need this, I need that. All that is what you write on paper. But you know, if you will pray about other people, God will be thinking about you. You don't need to write all those things on paper about yourself. You don't need to write all those things on paper about your family. You don't need to write all those things on paper about your job, about your having money. Forget all about that for some moment and pray about suffering and perishing people. If you are concerned about others, angels of God will be concerned about you. God will be concerned about you. Jesus will be concerned about you. Other believers will be concerned about you. If you will forget about yourself, if you will forget about your need, and you begin to pray for the needs of other people, people dying in hospital, people roaming about the street, people with rebellious children, people that they do not know what they will do. They have cases in court, they have this, they have that, and people that are not born again. If you are thinking about them, if you are praying about them, God will give you a vision. And in the midst of it, he will solve your problem. You tell me, when Elijah was concerned about the people, did he go hungry? You tell me, when that woman that had a child and the meal that was left, was, it was to take, she was to take that and die. But then Elijah said, just do for me first. Think about God and the kingdom of God and about the prophet of God. Leave your own problem alone. Did she go hungry? 
when David was going about fighting battles for the nation, killing Goliath, killing Lion, killing Bear, and stopping all these enemy nations from overtaking Israel. Did he have any luck? Oh no. The only time he got into trouble is when he began to think about himself. And he rested. And he didn't go to the battle. And he said, Job and others, you can go this time. I want to rest. I want to think about myself now. That's the only time he got into trouble. You see, when you think about other people, you plan about other people, and you are praying for other people, for the people that are suffering, for the people that are perishing, God will give you vision. Apart from the vision, God will, God will meet your need. Apart from meeting your need, God will do everything that you, uh, everyone even thinks you cannot think about. He will do everything for you. And this retreat, I want you to begin to think about people that are perishing, people that are suffering, people that have gone astray. Little children that do not know the way of the Lord. Think about people having problems, those who are suffering. And God will give you a vision. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 from verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned, we have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. He began to pray. And it was when he prayed that the Lord began to give him vision. Verse 20. Whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. While Daniel was praying for the needs of the people, the people in captivity, they had suffered for 70 years. And he saw that according to the writing of the prophet Jeremiah, they should be delivered out of this captivity after 70 years. He began to pray. He confessed his own sin. And that may surprise you. You say he was a prophet of God. What kind of sin was he confessing? It's not stealing. It's not adultery. It's not fornication. It's not idol worship. He was con confessing his own shortcoming. You see, you too, you have a lot of shortcomings. You have been selfish. That's a sin you will have to confess. Only thinking about yourself. You have not thought about the people in the house fellowship. Like uh, you think about yourself. You have not been loving enough. You have not been caring enough. You have not been compassionate enough. You have not given yourself to the service of the Lord enough. You have not given your clothes to uh, clothe the naked. You have not given enough food to the hungry. You have not uh, taken care of people that are dying and perishing. You have not brought people to the Lord. Don't you know a person that doesn't have any comfort has sin to confess? His hardness of heart, his um, failure, and his uh, spiritual lack. Oh yes, you need to confess your sin. You need to confess your weakness and shortcoming. You need to tell the Lord, Oh Lord, I know that I've been a person of no vision, no voice, no future. If I continue like this, I will never be able to lead anyone out of the wilderness journey. He began to confess his sin. And the sin of the people, while he was doing that, he received a vision. If you are proud, if you think you are all right, if you think there is no shortcoming, there is no failure, and yet the work under your hand is not growing, if you do not confess your shortcoming, you will never be able to have a vision. And, and yet, without vision, there will be no voice. Without voice, there will be no future. Not only that, I said, number one, see to them. See their need. Number two, ask of their deplorable condition and begin to get concerned. Number three, share with men of great burden. 
other people that have body, other people that have vision, other people that have insight, insight to the perishing, and they have interest and love and desires to see other people saved, discuss much with them. Read books on evangelism, on passion for the laws. Read books of people that were missionaries, people that suffered a lot, people that forsook every convenience, every luxury, people that forsook every pleasure of life, and they sold their lives, committed their lives to reach out to the perishing, share with them. Read their ideas, read their books, and read about their consecration. Number four, I said you pray for the suffering and the perishing. Number five, avoid people and avoid things that cause you to lose vision. Once you have got the vision, do not be an intimate friend to somebody who doesn't have any vision, who doesn't have any interest, who is not interested in evangelism, who is not interested in saving the laws, who will only be thinking, well, I have my problem, I have all the things that bug me down, I want to get to a higher institution, I want to be able to get married, I want to get into politics, I don't know why I do not have, I'm not a millionaire by now. I only, I only have one car. I've been praying for the second car I didn't have. Don't be intimate with such people. All you can do for such people is to challenge them. Don't allow them to influence you. Don't allow them to steal your vision away. Avoid people and avoid things that cause loss of vision. Because according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, Evil communications corrupt good manners. Then number six, write the vision down. Read the vision always. Meditate on the vision often. Write the vision down. Read the vision always. And meditate on the vision often. You are getting some vision in this uh, workers' retreat. Write them down. The Lord is opening your heart towards people in the hospital. Write it down. Towards people in the prison, write it down. Towards people in the villages, write it down. Towards the poor and illiterate people, write it down. Towards the people in the slum areas with mosquitoes biting them, evil spirits suppressing them, write it down. Towards perishing women, the prostitutes in hotels, write it down. Towards people in the sports field and in the cinema houses, write it down. Towards the relatives of the people in hospitals, write it down. Towards the teenagers that are just roaming about the street, roaming about in, roaming about in motor parks, write it down. Towards the secondary school children and primary school children, God is giving you a vision towards them, write it down. Towards the people that are heavy laden with problems of sin and sickness and suffering, nothing to eat, nothing to wear, write it down. Towards the beggars, towards the people that are refugees in the land, write it down. Towards religious people, you know, some of these religious people, they just go to their shrine or go to their places of worship and they're only religious and they're suffering. And inside them, if you talk to them, they are asking, how will I be saved? God is giving you a vision concerning these people, whatever, whoever they are, Muslims or other religious people, write it down. Workers in your place of work. You see, during the lunch hour time, why couldn't you have a fellowship? Why couldn't you get together with some people and begin to teach them? Are you only waiting for us fellowship on Sunday evening? Monday to Friday, you have all these people that are workers in your offices and they are roaming about and they are suffering and they are always getting sick leave because of the problems on their lives, in their families. God is giving you a vision towards all these workers. Write it down. As God is giving you all this vision and you write everything down, you read the vision you have written down always. You meditate upon them often in Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. Verses 1 and 2. Habakkuk, very near the end of the Old Testament. Chapter 2. From verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. This man said, I will set my watch. And I will see what the Lord will say unto me. But then, am I going to answer when he reproves me? Am I going to respond in repentance when he reproves me? Am I going to say, oh Lord, I am sorry for my deadness. I'm sorry for my blindness. 
I'm sorry for my heart that never felt for the suffering. I'm sorry for my heart that never got concerned for other people. Or am I going to reply with excuse? I will see what I will answer. Whether I will answer in humility. Whether I will answer with repentance. Whether I will answer with commitment and consecration. When he rebukes me. And then verse 2. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Write the vision. Make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. You see, the reason why some people do not continue in the ministry is that when God gave them vision many years ago, they never wrote it down. When they first became a worker and God began to speak to their hearts what he wanted them to do, he laid burden upon them, he gave them insight and revelation what they should do for different categories of people, they never wrote it down. So when discouragement came, there was nothing to refer to. When suffering came, there was nothing to refer to. But God told Habakkuk, write the vision. Write it down. Write it in simple language. Make it plain. But make it so serious that anybody who reads it, whether you are another person, anybody who reads it will begin to run. Will run with the vision. Will run so that the vision will have a great impact upon him. You know why people are limping? They cannot run. You know why people are crawling and they cannot run? You know why people are walking leisurely and they cannot run? You know why people are taking it easy and they cannot run? They do not write the vision down. And they do not read the vision often. And they do not meditate upon the vision. You know why some people, they are in house fellowship and they appear zealous for a month or for two months. And after that, there is no vision again. After that, there's no body again. After that, they cannot run again. You know why? They didn't write the vision down. You know why some women representatives, you know why they are not running with the vision? When they first got the vision that now our women should reach out to the women, women that are perishing, women that are suffering. Now women in the church, we are releasing you so that you can reach out to the women. The women jumped up. They were very happy. They were excited about it. They dreamt about it. They talked about it. They prayed about it. They were very, very active about their activities concerning the women. But you know why everything is slow now and sluggish? And they are not doing it. And they cannot do it. And a lot of difficulties. And, you know, children are crying. Husband is demanding. And trade is not working well. Office is demanding on them. You know why? They did not write the vision down. But write it. Make it plain. That he that readeth it may run. You know why some people in the past, they were with the school outreach. The DLSO. And when they first got started, they visited those children, they prayed with them, they fasted with them, they made sure that they would lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Eventually, you find out they cannot visit those children anymore, they cannot see them anymore, they do not have a vision anymore now. They did not write it down, they become interested in another thing now, I think I ought to be in the choir. I think I will be among the ushers. I think I will join the adult house fellowship. You know why? They didn't write the vision down. They didn't make it plain. And they didn't write it in such a way that when they are reading and meditating upon that vision, they will begin to run when they read. They will begin to cry when they read. They will begin to pray when they read. They will begin to get more concerned when they read. You know, when we started the house fellowship, it was wonderful. In uh, 1983, February were just about 6,000. By the end of that year, we had become 10,000. All people that were involved with house fellowship system, they visited people. Do you know when we started to tell people to rise up in our church? That is, you are coming for the first time, get up on your feet. And as you get up on your feet, now we uh, welcome you, we're happy you are here. When we began to do that, and people will look at them, they'll be very happy that person is from our zone. That person is from my area. And after the meeting, they'll be saying, now I need the card of one of those people. I think it's in my area. They get the card. That same Sunday, they will follow up the person. And in one week, they would have visited the person three times. They had vision for the newcomers. 
they had vision for the people that have just come. Everybody was happy that these newcomers were coming to the church. And the newcomers will say, they pestered my life, they visited me, and they came to me. Do you know when we started house fellowship, if you visited a nursing mother, you will help them wash all their clothes, you will help them sweep the ground, you will help them wash their dishes in the kitchen. You will, even if somebody was sick, you will sleep with them in the evening. A man to a man, a woman to a woman. And the people said, what kind of church is this? They will not leave you alone. Even when they see you smoking, after you have finished your smoking, they will say, my friend, God loves you. And the smoke will never drive them away. What kind of people are these? That's why people are rushing to the church, rushing to the church. In 1984, we started with, um, with 10,000 at the beginning of that year. By the end of that year, we became 18,000. We almost doubled in one year. You know why? There was vision. Every brother, every sister, everyone, they were saying, I want to do something for the Lord. This is my convert. After this, after the um, house fellowship, you find them still following the people at home. Did you understand the word of God? Did you get what our leader was saying? And they will follow them up. They will accompany them to their houses. They will pray with them and do a lot with them. But they did not write the vision down. The vision has evaporated. It's no more there. No more love. No more caring. No more visitation. If we visit anybody now, we visit the people with a whip in our hand. You didn't come to our fellowship. You are a backslider. You are a sinner. You are the one that has gone astray. That's what we do now. No love. No concern. We don't cry for them. We don't weep for them. We don't pray for them. Write the vision down. Read the vision often. Meditate upon the vision always. And number seven, act to sustain the vision. Act. Act. Don't just sit down, act. Don't just talk, act. Don't just teach, act. Don't just say, I'm a worker, act. Act according to the vision God has given you. God has begun to speak to your heart about poor people, act. About illiterates, act. About prisoners, act. About hospital patients, act. About the people that have relatives of sick people, begin to act. About children that are dropped out of school, God is talking to your, uh, to your heart, act, act, act immediately. You must act to sustain the vision. And you see, when you act to sustain the vision, you will use your vehicle. That's your action. You will use your money. That's your action. You will use some of your clothes that you are condemning, that you cannot wear again. You will give to other people that is acting. You will not eat your food alone. You will give part of your food to those who are hungry, that is acting. You will spend part of your money in bringing other people that are less fortunate, that don't have money, that is acting. You will, when people are getting married, you will support them. You will support them. Somebody is getting married in your zone, getting married in your district, and the people have been a worker with you all along. You, you never find this, these people. This person is getting married and is having a time of joy in her life, in his life. The action according to your vision. If you really want to help people, you will attend their wedding. You will support them. Ah, sister, anything I can do for you? Any place I can play in the reception? What, what thing can I do with you? What can I go with you when you are going to pay dowry? You will act. It is that that will sustain the vision. You find people that have been taken by policemen and they are locking them behind the cell. You will ask, what can you do? If you're a policeman yourself, if you're an intelligent, uh, highly placed person yourself, you will know, what can I do? You find beggars on the street, you are having vision about them, you will ask. You, are you working in the village? Are you working in the suburb? You will act. You will not just be sleeping every time. Look at all these, uh, you know, all these uh, areas where we are. Look at, you know, the community. Look at the people that are perishing. If God has given you a vision, you will act. Isaiah saw a vision. And when he saw that vision, and then he heard the voice of the Lord that said, Who shall I send? Who shall go for us? And because he had seen the vision, he acted immediately, said, Lord, here am I. Here is my money. Here is my life. Here is my talent. Here is everything I have. Whatever I have that you want to use. Here is even my family. Here am I. The totality of who I am. What I have. What I possess. Here am I. Send me. That's the action that will sustain the vision in your life. No vision. No voice. No future. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Confess your sin before God. Your sin of being hardened. Your sin of not showing concern. Your sin of laziness. 
your sin of indolence, your sin of not caring for people, your sin of not loving people, your sin of not being tender with people, your sin of not keeping the vision that God has given you, the sin of not acting, the sin of not sitting with the people where they are, the sin of not asking about the deplorable conditions of people, the sin of not sharing body. Confess your sin before the Lord and say, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me. God wants us to have vision. He wants us to have vision. He wants us to have vision. No vision, no voice. No voice, no future. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this message. Lord, we thank you because you have opened our eyes. Lord, we have seen our shortcomings. Lord, we have seen the areas that we have disappointed you. Lord, we have shown us that where there is no vision, there will be no, uh, no voice, and there will be no future. As leaders in the zone and in the district, in the house fellowship, Lord, because we don't have visions, all the people in the house, they are dying spiritually. The work is not progressing the way it should be progressing. Lord, we have seen ourselves. We know that we have offended you. But Father, we are asking, because of Jesus Christ, we pray that we have mercy on us. Father, because of Jesus Christ, your Son, we pray that we pardon us. Lord, we pray that all that was spoken to us, Lord, as we are repenting, we pray that our repentance will be genuine in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we are praying that as workers, you have you've told us that we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things shall be added unto us. Father, we are selfish. We have been thinking about ourselves. We have been thinking and praying about our own problem. Whereas people around us, we do not think about them. We do not pray for them. We do not visit them. There are brethren in the house fellowship that are sick. We are not we felt or concerned. There are people, our brethren, who, 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 who were dead in the past, but we felt that it's not our concern. Father, in all the areas that you have corrected us today, we just pray that we will be obedient children in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we just pray because of Jesus Christ, that all that we've heard today, that every one of us will, will run with the message. We will heart on the message. And the message will prosper in our hands in the name of Jesus Christ. We bless you because of have answered. I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to stay out of the door. I just thank God for all this provision. I just bless you with God.